Boom. All right. Welcome, welcome to our Back to the South study course session Monday, uh, session 15 or 16 or 17, something like that. Um, I hope everyone is safe and healthy, and it's great to have you all here again. Uh, today, we are um, again back to our uh, the main topic of our course, or at least how this course is starting, which is we're going through uh, the Getty Manuscript of Fiore de Liberi. We're going through it one play at a time, uh, from start to finish. So uh, with the principal intention of getting a chance to look at what is often missed um, when we're just training on the Sal floor. Because there is quite a bit of distance between the manuscript and what um, most um, people at a recruit level, at an entry level, um, there's quite a bit of distance between what most people experience there and the manuscript. Um, you know, for good reason, we have to redact it and teach it to you and all the rest of it. But um, taking a look at the manuscript is always really uh, help, helpful and um, good for your education. And we're taking a look at it now. Uh, the broad plan is to continue with the manuscript until we finish. And then I think we're going to move on to Filippo Vadi which is um, a manuscript just after Fiore, which borrows heavily from Fiore, or so it seems, and I think it will be good for all of us. Um, I am principally the one uh, free scholar who is taking us through this course on Mondays. You are therefore getting principally my view on most things, although some other scholars and free scholars um, are able to share their thoughts here um, occasionally. But it's important that you know that my view is merely one of many, and not only that, but nothing is the case just because um, your you know, free scholars say it so. We want you guys to be convinced by the same evidence that we're convinced by. And the evidence for us is, uh, much of the evidence anyway, uh, uh, in our art is in this book. The rest is in experience <laughs> and in other books and, and things. But anyway. Um, if you, you guys have any questions at any time, please do speak up or type them in the chat so I'll see. Um, if you have a question, chances are four more people have the same question. So no questions. Uh, Aaron, mm -hmm. It looks like some of us are having an issue with the uh, the stream. Could you possibly restart it? Because it, sure. weird thing is happening. We're seeing it in a thumbnail, but it's not actually popping up. Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I can't. Absolutely. Let me cancel the stream and start it back. Stop streaming. Can everybody still hear me? Yep. I assume yep. so. Okay, great. Okay. So. Uh, okay, I'm trying the stream again. How's that? Can anybody not see the stream? Right now I have my browser open with uh, Emma Wiki on the Largo section. For me, it's still loading. Yeah, it's loading for me too. Loading, eh? Interesting. Yeah. Let yeah, me, it's just been close. loading perpetually. Okay, let me close some things. Maybe it's because I have some browser open. Uh, yeah, I don't have any other applications open. Um, is it still loading for other people? Yeah. Okay, maybe. Let me the thing is, we, we can see the thumbnail, so like, uh, I don't think it's an internet issue. It might be a Discord issue. Yeah, interesting. Let me try sharing just the browser, not my whole screen, because usually I share my whole screen so I can use the snip and whatever. But uh, let me try. OK, so now I'm just sharing the browser. How's that? I can hear you now, but there's nothing. No way eh? on the stream. Still, still loading, yeah. Loading. Huh. Yeah, I'm not seeing a darn thing. The um, the link said it was invalid, so maybe there was a typo in the link or something. Oh, I don't need know. the invite link for today. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um. Okay. <laughs> well, this is new. All right, this is a new problem that Fiori didn't prepare us for. The <laughs> the screen that works every every week isn't working. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, interesting. BD here. Yes, BD. Uh, so I ignore the link and I just, whenever I come in, I just go straight to the armory and then I find your name and then I share the screen through there. Mm -hmm. um, people could try that. They could, they could try it and then back in. 
another yeah. aspect another aspect is um i only use the app i found in the past if i'm using the internet browser that screws things up yeah if any of you are using the app uh, sorry the browser the, uh, the internet browser mm -hmm. and having these issues it might be because of the you're using discord through the browser and i'm using the... the app and i'm still getting the issue oh yeah interesting yeah, i'm well, using usually... the app as well interesting Same here. Usually it's not an issue, so it's it could be just Discord. Let me let me see here. Hmm. Um, hmm. What, what would fix it? What would fix it? A sharp blow to the head. <clears throat> yeah, no kidding, eh? Huh. Oh, sorry. Wait. I think I might have just killed your thing. Can anybody see my live? My uh, my stream. I can't see anything. Can't it's see anything. No, actually, yeah. Like, no, actually, yeah. Oh. It says, do you want a party? Do you want a party? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, no, hold on. Right. Uh, yeah, no. Um, okay, interesting. I will stop sharing now. <laughs> so, it's, yeah, okay. so I guess it's not... Okay, so... Um... <laughs> okay, cool. It's just an errand problem. Well... Is that like a Zoom link, maybe? Huh. Hmm. Um, hmm. Aaron Beatty. Uh, oh, wait, I have a Zoom. Yeah, wait, I have access to Zoom. Hold on. I'm going to get my wife. She's going to rescue us. Wife! <laughs> help! <laughs> Carol, I need your help. Okay, all right, people. This is going to be super unorthodox. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to get it. Uh, okay. I'm going to give everyone a Zoom link. I'm going to try Zoom. We have a professional account, right? Yeah. So it's not going to time it after 45 minutes? No. Okay. Uh, okay, new meeting. Um, join with... And how do I invite people to this thing? Participants, Participants invite. Oh, okay. All right, sweet. So everybody, let's try this. I have a Zoom window or a Zoom room open right now. I'm going to put a Zoom invite link in the chat right here. And let's try, let's try Zoom. Okay. If you can't get into the Zoom room, please type it in the chat. And let's try and maybe shift this all to Zoom and let's see if that works. Okay. I, I apologize to everyone uh, for the uh, technical difficulties. It is uh, not my <laughs> not my fault. Discord's being an asshole this evening. Okay. So we'll see you all in the Zoom uh, meeting room in five minutes. Okay. Uh, if I make a, may make a suggestion, you could also post the link on Facebook just in case. I will do that. The, yeah. I will do that. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll also stay in this room until everybody's here. Uh, how do I see participants? A few people enter the meeting. Oh, Zoom. Admit. Where are these participants? Yeah, one by one by one. yeah I think you're going to have to accept people View. to join yeah. the meeting. Yeah, admit. Admit. Participants. How do we close that window? Oh, I don't know. Oh, hey. I see. Here we go. Here we go. Admit. Admit. Okay, we can do this. <coughs> we can totally do this. Okay, and I'm going to... Okay, can you guys see my screen? We can. We, we can, can also hear an echo, echo from, from the. the yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah. Well. Yeah. It's just from having Discord and Zoom open at the same time. Mm. Okay. Yeah, let me close the screen. <laughs> that should work.
of BDMN. I think the video quality seems even more crisp through Zoom. Oh, really? Oh, wow. yeah. it, is, it is better. Wow. Awesome. All right, let me copy. Wait, where's the invite link? It's gotten better over the last year. <laughs> copy invite link. I got to post this on Facebook. Because thank you very much for the rescue, wife. You're amazing. I'm glad you're not to get all no. Okay. Did demo a play on you? Is that what you thought? Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Um, who else is waiting to get in here? Is there anybody else waiting to get in here? Well, <clears throat> oh, Kelly, I'm not you're sure where oh, you're in here. You got it. You got it open in Zoom now. Uh, yep, yep. Um. Okay. Oh, admit. Okay. Participants. Here we go. Okay. I think mostly everybody made it over. Well, so let me see. So that's good. But what, what do we do for a link here? Uh, I put oh. the link yeah, in Discord and I put it in. Uh... Okay. Mm. So if you click on that link in Discord there, uh, Cal, it should work. I, I can't find it. Um, it's in the general chat. If you um, click on text channels general. Okay. It's just above ah, the. There we go. Got yeah. it. Got it. So, got it. Then once you're over, just uh, leave a uh, Discord. Okay. A BD, you're uh, in in uh, Zoom, right? Yep. Great. Okay, Kelsey. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I'm in now. Thanks. Awesome. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, so um, we're all we're all in Zoom now, are we? Uh, can everybody see my screen? Uh, can anybody not see my screen? Silence is good. Okay, great. So there we are. We uh, oh, there's chats, 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 chats. Yep, everybody. There is an echo. Oh, we solved the echo. We solved the echo, right? Oh, echo yes, solved. Yes, Perfect. Yes. Awesome. All right. Sweet. All right. We we rescued it. <laughs> okay. So, um, again, my apologies for the technical difficulties. We had to pivot on our feet. It's a it's a blindingly infuriating technological age that we're in. All right. So where were we? So I was uh, giving the blobby intro. Um, right. So this week we're um, in uh, we're in Jogo Largo. Last week, um, we dealt with the cuts and some other f um, fighting principles, and we actually, um, yeah, we took some time to talk about the cuts, and um, we entered into uh, Zogo Largo, okay? Um, does anybody have any questions about anything that we talked about last week that they wanted to ask before we get into it? No? Okay, cool. So um, again, we're still in the sword in two hands uh, section, um, as I have envisioned it here or sort of uh, defined it. We have this, the sword in two hands section begins with the guards, um, the first six, and then the next 12. Then we have the cuts, then we have a preface section, and then we have Largo, Stretto, and then a final master. Um, so I did want to say one thing about a topic that we talked about last week um, that I, uh, over the last week, I've been kind of thinking about it. And uh, I think I didn't intentionally misrepresent uh, something about the cuts, but 
the 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 position that I presented about the cuts last week, I think I um I didn't appreciate the variety of opinion there was on it. Um I don't like this at the top. How do I hide this? Uh anybody know how to hide this at the top? I don't like this thing. Hide it. Can I just can I click and drag it? Aha! I can click and drag it. Can I click drag it over here? Perfect. All right, cool. Um, great. So um, I didn't really appreciate the, the yeah, as I said, the uh, variety of opinion on this. Um, I, I presented my opinion last week, um, or I presented the view with the argument, which happens to be uh, what I hold as well, that the uh, these these cuts here, the Fendenti, the Sotani, the uh, Mezzani, and the Punta, these angles are less about the path of what the cut is taking than what can be on the target of what can be the target of the cut and i justified this by saying that um i thought this was so because all cuts finish in posta longa that's what i said so on the wednesday a scholar session there was significantly more discussion about this point of view than i anticipated and um, i just thought i would come back a bit and um, underline that the view that holds these angles as more targeting than the path of where a cut travels, teeth and knees, knees to teeth, um, there are many who support um, that view, the, the view that these cuts represent the path rather than um, something else like targeting, okay? Uh, I think I, I just wanted to say that I spoke about it very matter-of-factly. I didn't really go into much detail about different views on that, so now I, now I have. And again, one of the reasons why I'm pausing to take, to take that time to talk about it is because um, I think it's really important that recruits, you know, new people who come into this art, study it with their eyes wide open. It is, or rather, it has a significant academic element. And in academics, people disagree over the same thing. That's just how it is. Complex things have smart people disagree about it. And so if you're going into this art looking for one straight answer, you're, I'm sorry, this is not the thing. This is not a place to get straight answers, right? There's lots of disagreements about, um, about, about things here. And the faster you accept that, and find wisdom in where opinions are the same and where opinions are different, the more you'll learn about fencing, in my view. So with that out of the way, um, let's get to today's uh, topic. So we, we've we been in the sword and two-hand section for a while now. We've looked at a lot of, uh, of, uh, of guards, we looked at the cuts, and we got into uh, Azogo Largo. Last week, we looked at the first four plays of Largo, and um, we talked about them. We also kind of talked about, or we set up our understanding for how we were going to view the rest of the section. So we only we only got to these first four, but in a sense, we talked about all of the, the plays. So we're going to finish the Largo section today, I'm sure. But before we um, move on to the next play in our list, which is going to be this guy, the second scholar, I just want to very quickly summarize uh, the um, the view that I presented, the organizational view that I presented on uh, uh, last Monday. And the organizational view I presented is, roughly speaking, this. That in Largo, it's important for fencers to understand the logic of fencing in order to bring order to something that seems so uh, chaotic. And the logic of fencing, broadly speaking, and very oversimplified, is that the first actor, as long as they're threatening the enemy, they're leading the tempo, they're leading the engagement, and the second actor is following. And as long as someone's leading and someone's following, the leader is presenting threats 
and the follower is mitigating those threats. Okay, in a Largo engagement, the leader and follower could change very rapidly, right? In the example of a single time remedy that we were talking about in this in the context of the first master last week, we were talking about a situation where an attacker gives an attack, say a fendente, and the defender, the patient agent, who is acting after, right, who is following the attacker, the patient agent makes a cover in such a way that not only does it prevent the attack from hitting him, but it also steals the tempo and makes him instantly the leader. Okay, so the, in Largo, there's lots of examples of the tempo switching, who's leading, who's following the tempo switching. But it's important, uh, in my opinion, in, to understand the plays and how they make sense. It's important to inflict that framework upon these plays and fit in the context uh, or, or fit these plays into that context, just in the way that we understood that uh, framework in the dagger section. Because if you recall, we talked a lot about leading and following and tempo in the dagger section, um, and all of those rules still apply, is what I is what I said. So, um, so last week when we when we ended uh, when we ended up, we talked about in the first master Fiore says, um, I, I, you know, against an attack here we're crossed at the tips, and when we're crossed at the tips, there's a few things we can do. One thing we can do is cut on the right side, right? And in this context, he's engaging the sword um, on his uh, the scholar's right side, or in this case, the master's right side. So on the side that the engagement begins on, Fiore says, well, I can either cut him on this side if I can, or if I can't, I can cut him on the other side. And I submitted to you that it was my thought that the only way this makes sense is if the patient is now leading and what makes the patient lead by the time of the engagement is an attempt at a single time remedy so the narrative i gave was the agent attempts a single time remedy against a basic attack in order to prevent themselves from dying the attacker turns their edge in to affect a bind but now they're following and as long as the um the master keeps that a tempo advantage they can then decide to do one thing or the other and everything that fury says here makes sense perfect sense oh, Aaron, mm -hmm. it looks like a few people are uh, yeah waiting to be let into oh. chat oh okay um great thank you for letting me know let me fix that oh uh Sorry if I spoke admit... maybe. no 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 please oh uh, my bad submit okay you guys in yeah, I'm in now. Sweet. Uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Apologies again, everyone, for the technical difficulties. All right. Um, sorry. For those of you who are waiting in the lobby, um, I just kind of, I'm just finishing summarizing last week. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, Graham. Um, okay. So so that's that's more or less what I said about the um, these first two plays. And then... Finally, with these two plays here, the second master, we get a crossing at the middle, and we get more or less the same instruction from Fury. We say if you cross at the middle, and if you if you have the right side open, you can uh, you you can take it. Um, the last thing I want to um, uh, I guess reemphasize is a word that I'm using a lot. I'm using the word engagement. And I'm using it in a very specific sense. When I say engagement, I'm referring to specifically swords touching. A moment when swords are touching. As opposed to before they touch, which I wouldn't consider an engagement. So engagement as in, you know, used in a loose sense is like, you know, there's two there's two fighters and they're they're engaged with each other, right? One's in Ladonna, one's in left tail and they're fighting right that's not what i mean when i say um when i'm referring to the engagement i'm referring to specifically the fight now that the swords have crossed okay that's a very important term um for for us so that's anyways so that's kind of where we left off that's kind of where we left off and we're going to look at the rest of the plays 
with this logic in mind, with this tempo logic uh, in mind to help us understand them. Does anybody have any questions about that? No? Okay. Great. All right. So let's move on. So um, one, two, three, four. We're now on to the fifth scholar, second of the uh, second master, folio 25 VC. Uh, BD, you're the first on my list. Would you like to give us a read? Certainly. My master, whom we saw earlier, taught me that when I am crossed at the middle of the sword, I should step immediately and grasp his blade as shown so that I can strike him with a cut or thrust. I can also mess up his leg, as you will see next, either in the shin or right under the knee. All right. 25 VC. Hmm. Let's read the next one as well, because I think we can talk about these in the same breath. 25 VD. Here's 25 VD. So we see in the last te text he mentioned to shin, so here is a very similar action, but there's a shin kick here, and the sword is also striking. And uh, Connor, would you like to read this one for us? This essay. <laughs> How do I sound? Good. Wonderful. The student before me cited what his and my master taught us, which I am now doing with little trouble. Thanks, Vera. You're a man of few words. All right. So here we go. We have these two plays, 25 VC and 25 VD. So, um, <laughs> so we did start the Largo section with plays at the tip of the sword, right? We actually managed to make it through four plays without getting to entries. <laughs> but now we have two entries, or rather two things which are, you know, two plays which involve the use of our offhand, okay? And in common parlance for us, that's um, that's uh, that's entries at Emma, right? Plays with entries. So what are these? What's going on here, okay? So um, Fiori doesn't say it, but entering on the hand, or sorry, um, entering onto the blade of the sword requires, uh, broadly speaking, requires a certain general context kind of uh, kind of thing to happen in the fight. And it fits um, very importantly with the nature of Largo. OK, so first, let's get this uh, notion out of the way that putting your hand on a sword is dangerous, even on the on the first third. Right. Even the sharpest knife, in order for the knife to, or the blade to cut your hand, your hand has to move against the blade, right? It ha the, the, the blade either has to remain still and your hand has to move across it or your bla the, the blade and, and your hand have to move in different directions along with some level of, of course, pressure. But if that doesn't happen, if your hand and the blade remain fixed together, even if collectively that shape moves, your hand isn't necessarily going to get cut, right? The sword isn't a lightsaber. And that's even if the edge of the of the sword here is extremely sharp. Not least if you're wearing some kind of uh, gloves, right? Now, also, even if you were to receive some sort of superficial cut on the hand, that does not, in fact, diminish the effectiveness of these plays. So these two plays here, Yes, they're both blade grabs, but let's talk about what they are really, right? The class of thing they are. They're not just two things you can do by grabbing the blade. They are blade grabs in general, all right? And blade grabs in general in Largo are amazing. They're pretty, they're pretty fantastic. Because as we know from what the definition of Largo, right? Largo is the sword being able to move as free as is as its nature wants, right? The sword, the long, uh, the sword in two hands cuts. It needs space and time, and it cuts very well when it's free to move. As soon as it's not free to move, it's a much diminished tool, right? It's a much diminished tool. And so, if you're in a Largo situation where there's lots of space between you, there's a leader follower, the tempo's light, it's moving, 
and all of a sudden your sword gets frozen holy shit that is a, that is a mind-blowingly terrible thing to happen to you okay mind-blowingly terrible and not least because what counts as frozen is literally folding your hand over one side of the sword that's it no pressure no grabbing with your fingers none of that if you were to just fold your hand over the edge of a sword you you've you've gained an amazing advantage in largo right principally that he can't move his sword freely and anything he does with his sword you can feel directly all right you're you're you're, you're grappling the sword right you have direct you have direct um uh, hand contact on the sword so that uh, that's an incredible advantage and if you're in a situation as is typical in, in largo where there's lots of space between you and the enemy then your sword still has space to move and his doesn't so whenever you can get blade grabs they're absolutely incredible and um and, and fury would approve uh i would approve in my view however how do you get them and this is a great topic because many <laughs> many the the broken hand many the bloody stump of an emma recruit and scholar has emerged from the whirring blades of largo <laughs> in a in a forlorn attempt to grab a sword <laughs> <laughs> and I say that with very fond memories of my own um, massive fuck-ups when I was learning how to do this. So there's a very specific context in which sword grabs are are um, are uh, available, and specifically that is best, right? And again, we're talking we start we start to talk about optimums here. The best situation when when sword grabs present themselves are from a crossing at the middle, where the sword of the enemy is in your presence. Okay, so if you could, if you have a crossing at the middle where their, their swords are very vertical, right, and their sword isn't really near you, right, then sword grabs aren't really they're not first on your mind. Okay, but if you're cross at the middle and their sword is kind of in your presence, it's you know right here. And if if you have sword grabs at the at the top of your memory, right? If this offhand, like a chameleon's tongue, right, is waiting, right, waiting to go, you can catch these swords, okay? And you're gonna catch them still, and that's the key. Blade grabs are best done when the sword is still, the sword of the enemy is still. And one of the only ways to know that it's still is, of course, to be in touch with it, right? To actually be in, in an engagement with it. You don't want to think it's still and have that sword or that, that hand come out to try and grab a sword that's actually floating in midair, right? Nine, 99,000 times out of uh, 100,000, <laughs> that sword, even if it's floating in midair, is not going to be still. But if it's engaged with you and if you feel yeah. like you have a bind, right? then you might have one moment for this for this offhand to shoot out, grab that sword, and then you have an incredible advantage. What he's actually doing here in these plays is pretty obvious. I think it's not too mystical. He's, in this play, he's, um, he's checked the sword with his hand, and he's just cutting himself, right? Simple. And in this play, he is, he's doing kind of two things at once. You could do one of these at once. You could do the other. You could do them both. He's checked the sword in the same way, but he's also kicking the shin, right? He's doing an, an, an interesting shin kick. And it's it's interesting also because, uh, just from a, a, a scholarly sense, because this is one of the few times we see kicks in Fury, right? We didn't, except for the kick to the nuts in the Abizari section. Did we see any kicks in the dagger section? I'm not sure we did. I'm not sure we did. No. Yeah. So this is it's, it's interesting when Fury shows things that he often doesn't, right? So here's a kick. It seems to be turned to the side if pictures matter, right? Because he doesn't give details in the text. It seems to be turned to the side and to the shin, and this is in fact a pretty um, a devastating kick if you can pull it off. So, um, so this is kind of what we're dealing with here, right? We're dealing with um, hand grabs, um, uh, hand entries to the first third of the blade. 
probably from a crossing at the middle and the optimum context is when the swords are uh, when the enemy sword is still the last thing i would want to say about this uh, myself is that this reinforces to me this is another data point that reinforces to me the um the nature of, of what i think largo is which is specifically something in motion right when you're not in motion in in largo you risk you seriously risk having your sword grabbed right that's the main problem and even even more so with a sword in one hand with a sword in one hand holy crap you better keep that thing whirring if it's you know if it's a, if it's if it's out if you brought the sword out from your posta you better keep that step moving because as soon as you you pause the instant you pause in an engagement that you know if that opponent's thinking blade grab then boom he could get it and then you're then in, in this case you're forced to press to stretto or run the hell away there's only two options and both of which are extreme right because you you if you just stay here and try and fight it you're probably going to get hit with this okay so very cool right very 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 interesting that he shows us the blade grabs and with not that much commentary as well which is also curious okay uh, any questions about that um yeah i just yep. have a quick one uh, mm -hmm. so just to keep this in context we're mm -hmm. coming from the second largo master mm -hmm. um so he's trying to do that single time action deflection kill it doesn't work it's come to a bind and then mm -hmm. you grab the sword left foot's forward and then mm -hmm. you step with the right and do the strike and kick and or kick uh yeah so in in this case if you wanted to read these scholars as uh the, if you wanted to read the footwork as drawn literally yeah. from the from the post and then what we would be looking at is yes you see he's he's attempted the single time remedy they've crossed um in the middle and he's left foot forward here and then he his left hand is shot up to grab the sword because it was in his presence and then he is mm -hmm. increased or he's passed forward he's passed forward with his right foot to strike with a sword or in this case to kick with his right foot right okay thank yeah. you that's all yeah um obviously it, it goes without saying that because the main hand of the sword is your right one then you're you're almost always going to make the sword grab with your uh your your offhand your left although there is one play in the shadow section which bucks this trend which is very interesting and we'll uh, i can't wait to get to that one that's a very unique play um yeah all right cool uh uh one last thing i really do encourage people when they're fencing to try and see if they can get these but unfortunately there's no way of getting good at them without pulling back hundreds of bloody stumps because what you guys are going to be trying to do or what you guys are going to be yeah you're going to be trying to grab still blades but you're going to be too eager to get the blade grabs and you're going to be uh, not paying attention to how the engagement really is. And the blade is going to be not still <laughs> and you're going to get your hand whacked. Right. Or even worse, if blade grabs are really, really in your memory, you might literally reach up and grab live blades. And I've done both of those things tons of times. It's just a consequence of having to, you know, uh, polish the turd to, to make it a diamond. So uh, it kind of sucks. Uh, but it's it's fantastic. It's a fantastic thing to train. It, it really is, and super valid, right? Anybody who's leaves a sword in your presence in a bind is asking for it to the blade to be grabbed. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. Okay, next one, the second scholar here. Twenty six R. Uh, and in case I missed the folios, there um, the first blade grab was twenty five VC folio 25 vc and the second was 25 vd so now we're on to 26 ra and rb which is the peasant strike here we go peasant strike who is next uh alex would you like to read the text for this one this action is called the peasant strike and is performed as follows wait for the peasant to launch his sword as you wait standard and arrow stands with your left foot forward when he attacks, perform an offline acrisimento with your left foot to the opponent's right, followed by an oblique pass with your right foot, catching his cut with the middle of your sword. Let his sword glide to the ground and immediately respond with a fendente to the head or arms, or with a thrust of the chest, as you will see next. This play is also effective using a sword against an axe, as well as against a heavy or light staff. 
Thank you, Alex. So here we go, 26 <clears throat> RA, the peasant strike. And let's also look at 26 RB, which as it turns out is um, the finish of the peasant strike. So can we have uh, Amber, would you like to read this one for us? Before me, we saw the peasant strike. Now I have put my point into the opponent's chest. I could have also had, have cut a fendente to his head and arms, as was mentioned before. If the opponent tries to counter with a reverso under my arms, I immediately perform an accrescimento with my left foot and place my sword over his. This way, he cannot do anything. Awesome. Thank you, Amber. All right. So this is the finish of the peasant strike. This is also the infamous swan hat scholar in Fiore. Uh, this is definitely a future birthday present, I hope, for me. I, I <laughs> totally want a swan hat. Um, great ringtone. Um, right. <laughs> perfect when you're feeling fancy and need to murder somebody. Um, all right. So right, the peasant strike. Can mm -hmm. I ask a quick question? This yes. is the first uh, master, right? These are scholars of, like, it, it's just that uh we did the first master then, then a scholar mm -hmm. of the first master then mm -hmm. what's the like is there any deeper meaning to that it's a great question so i kind of started off um uh this this section by suggesting that i i didn't think that this sword uh section was as well organized as some other sections of fury that uh, we've looked at before specifically the dagger section and the dagger section follows fury's um crown and garter system pretty pretty well if not perfectly um you know, it seems to work out just as Fiore describes it. But here, the crown and garter system, to me, makes things a little more ambiguous. So specifically, if we're if we're going literally by what this this crown and garter system suggests, then every scholar that follows um, crowned master is the student of that master. And therefore, since there are two scholars or there are two masters here that begin the section, the first master only has one scholar. And everybody else is going to be a scholar of the second master. So by that logic, this peasant strike is a scholar of the second master. Okay. Now, I emphasize by that logic because, honestly, I'm not convinced. I think there's some interesting topics to discuss about that. I'm not really sure if this really works in the longsword section. But, you know, uh, strictly speaking, this is, uh, this is what it is. These guys are scholars of the second master does that answer your question yep okay and 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 that's a relevant point to begin with so um the peasant strike all right um how do we do it you know what happens fiore kind of describes it pretty well right and this is this is a you know he gives some decent context to it this is called a peasant uh the peasant's strike okay you wait for the peasant to launch his cut with his sword um kel um gave us some nice um uh, information last week about um, talking about the peasant strike and about how peasants are often, um, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, beasts of burden, you know, heavy, they work heavy in the fields, they, you know, they carry large tools, you know, they're, um, they're, they're, uh, they're hitting the clods in the field, et cetera, et cetera. They're not, um, they're not elegant uh, men of refinement, as it were, right? in um, great control of their of their strength and the conventional reading of the peasant strike is something uh, or fury calling uh, what fury is calling the peasant strike is something to do against somebody who comes in with a heavy blow right maybe even an immoderate blow uh, though fury also takes care to mention that this play is also effective when using a sword against an axe or against a heavy or light staff so we might read this as also being useful if you're fighting with a lighter weapon against a heavy one, right? And something that a heavy weapon will often do, especially against a weapon that they perceive as light, is it will come down with fendentes and things like that, right? Because it may not be able to resist them, right? The light, the light weapon combined with the strength of the opponent might crumble and not even make the, make the cut. So Fiore is saying that this is something that we might be able to do against a heavy weapon or against somebody who's giving us an immoderate 
blow of strength. Okay. But but it's a downward blow, right? Yes, that's 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 the sense of it. Anyway, I've never actually seen anybody interpret the peasant strike uh, with any anything other than a fendente, broadly speaking. Um, you know, although that that's not to say that there aren't lots of things you can do against people who fence immoderately, right? There's tons of stuff you could do, but this place specifically that Fiori's talking about um, is best suited to against fendentes. At least uh, classically speaking, right? So more or less what's happening here is Fiore is engaging the weapon, stepping out of the way, letting the weapon power down to where it wanted to go, and then letting the sword rotate and cutting his own cut. Okay? Um, there's no sense in me describing it super detailed because, of course, we're just it's just with words. We're not at the sal, so there's only really so much good in, in, there is in describing it. But the one thing I will say, and to your point, Alex, when you ask this question, whose master is, or whose scholar is this guy? One of the biggest mistakes that um, students at Emma make, and Kel mentioned this also last week, with the peasant strike, is that they start it too late. They engage the strong blow too late. And specifically at the middle of the sword. Right. So this um, these st strong blows are not necessarily slow blows. Right. And distance equals time in fencing. So if someone's coming down with a massive log splitter of a blow. Right. If you, the first time you touch it is when it's already halfway down your sword, you don't have that much time to figure out what the hell to do. You don't. Right. And you definitely don't want to guess that the blow that looks like it's going to be a log splitter is a log splitter. Because if you're if you're guessing that that big, then people are going to fake your ass out. Right. They're going to wind up huge blows and then go tippy tap, and, you know, cut three fingers off. Right. So you, you don't want to guess. Right. You want to touch. You want to touch to know. And if you wait too late to engage these big blows, what looks like big blows, you don't have very much time to figure it out, number one. And also, given what Fjord wants us to do here, you don't have very much space in your sword to do what he wants you to do. So the peasant strike, what Fjord says here, is best suited, in my view anyway, to a crossing at the tips. Where this blow is coming down, it's rocketing down from the sky, and you reach out in frontale, in frontale, not in finestra, kind of like it seems here. It kind of seems like this guy's in a, fin a finestra that's been crushed. You reach out in frontale, kind of like, you know, so, so it kind of looks like the, what, uh, what the master is. These guys are in kind of a frontale. You reach out as long as you can to engage the weapon, whether it's a poleaxe or a staff or so whatever. You reach out and touch it. And then as soon as you touch it, you're going to feel that pressure building on the sword. And by the if you've done it perfectly, by the time it hits the middle of the sword, you'll know a thousand percent that this blow is rocketing down. And you'll already be turning up to Finestra. So when this blow powers through, you're not going to be in some sort of a gross crust Finestra like in this picture. You're going to be well out of the way and your sword's going to be will have its rotation powered and ready to cut okay so if there's one thing that i would say here about this this play it's that um most people fuck it up because they engage it too late and when you engage it too late the sword rockets down and the only thing you can do is catch it on the cross or you try and come around anyway and it just looks gross and feels gross so that's not to say that you know sometimes all you can do is catch you know super big blows on the cross sometimes that's just you know the height of what you're able to do but that's not the peasant strike the peasant strike needs some time to step to the side do some little interesting footwork and cut the guy with his own the strength of his own blow and you got to receive the blow early for that okay but again that's just my view but that's the peasant strike very very classic uh, also circumstantially um one of these things that isn't often can I say this? Yeah, I think so. There isn't often a chance to do this at Emma, I find, because most of the time when people get to fencing at Emma, 
we you know we've drilled control into them sufficiently that people often don't do super huge big blows right so it's actually one of these things that um, i'd say it's less common to see on the floor uh, among, among fencers and although of course it does happen um but that just kind of uh, that idea reinforces the notion that this is someone who this is something that you're going to consider doing to someone who fences immoderately right lots of force and i don't want to you know sh <laughs> shit on anybody but this is something that i've seen very often in um fences coming from other places i've seen lots of fences coming from other places fence with uh, immoderate force and be vulnerable to this kind of uh, of action um by and large the fencers from our school um, aren't like that we have different issues different issues uh, any questions about that uh, can you also quickly look at the third scholar again just in this context the third scholar so this, yeah, the, one, the, oh, the swan hat the swan hat swan hat oh sure 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 so swan swan hat's just finishing the blow you know fury likes to do this he likes to sometimes he adds plays that don't don't really you know, they don't really add anything to what he said, but he likes to demonstrate the blows finished. So here, here the present striker has, has he struck through and he's actually come to middle boar's tooth, which is interesting. Um, and the swan hat guy has, uh, has it has done the peasant strike and is attacking with a thrust. Um, let's read this text again because he actually does say a couple things. Um, before me, we saw the peasant strike. Now I have put my sword into the opponent's chest. I could also have cut a fendente, so I think he's thrusting here, but he says, I could also have cut a fendente to his head and arms, as was mentioned before. If the opponent tried to counter with a reverso, so he, if he tried to come back up with a reverso blow, I would immediately step forward with my left foot and place my sword over his, and he wouldn't be able to do anything. It's my view that Fiore is referencing what he's going to talk about later in the section, which is the breaking of point, which is something that we see come from the topic of thrusts, but it's just a, another way that swords can engage uh, um, themselves. But, you know, very simply, you know, if, as soon as he cuts through, I'm going to hit him. If he cuts through and tries to cut back, I can uh, get on top of his sword and stop it. And then continue to do what I when I need to do, so that's that's what Swan Hats is talking about. Does that answer your question? Uh, yep, thank you. Awesome. All right. So okay, we got the hand grabs, we got the peasant strike. That's great. Let's move on. Now we got some more interesting, awesome stuff. We got the leg shot. Ba ba ba. Twenty six R C. The infamous leg shot. Can we have? Andrew, read the text for us, please. Okay. When the opponent attacks your leg, withdraw the foot you have forward or pass back and deliver a fendente to his head as shown here. However, with the sword in two hands, you should never attack below the knee because it would place you in too great, too much danger since it leaves your wholly uncovered. If you had fallen on the ground, Striking the opponent's leg would be fine, but not in any other circumstance when you were fighting with a sword against a sword. Thank you, Andrew. All right. So this is a bit of a one-off. Um, it's not really related to what comes next, I don't think, right? That's true. Yeah, that's right. So it's kind of a one-off, but it's, it's a real interesting um, play. And it, it's another example, in my view, of plays that work in and of themselves, but they're also topics. Okay, so this is the leg shot play. So strictly speaking, what Fiore is saying is if somebody is attacking your leg and the leg that he's attacking in this case is going to be is the right leg here. That's the leg he's attacked. What you're going to do is you're going to pass backwards with that leg, voiding it entirely. And you're not going to engage the enemy's sword but instead you're going to threaten their head with a cut. If you get it, great. If you don't, you don't. So um, this, this tells us a couple really interesting things. The first thing is that with respect to leg shots, he doesn't say don't do them. He says, with the two-handed sword, you should never attack below the knee because it would place you in too much danger 
since it leaves you wholly uncovered. So it would be wrong, in my view, to say that Fiore says you shouldn't do leg shots. And as a matter of fact, um, if I've learned anything from playing with a sword and shield, um, leg shots, once leg shots are regularly in the picture, if you're not used to your, you know, to the target area that you have to defend, being from your head to your knee, then you're in big, big, big trouble. <laughs> you're in deep shit. All right. Um, and I bring this up specifically because it was my experience that when I transitioned from a recruit to a scholar, my targeting experience was principally my upper body and my head. Because, of course, when we were doing drills in class, we were, had masks on, right? And we all, we hit the mask. We didn't hit the leg. We didn't hit the lower, you know, thighs or the, the you know, the lower chest. We hit the mask. Mask, 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 mask. So that's all, all what I kind of thought about, right? That was my target area. And over the years, I've had to expand my target area, both for myself, my own defense, but also in the targets that I'm seeking to hit. I've had to try and expand it and expand it, and I still have ways to go. I'm not really quite at the lower targets yet. It doesn't come off into my mind. But the point is, is that um, having this large target area as an attacker is hugely beneficial. Hugely beneficial, because it takes effort and attention for the defender to actually guard this whole area well. The sword has to move a lot more to guard this whole area than it does just to guard the upper uh, upper chest and the head. And so if you have leg shots as a regular, um, I, I, I wanna say spice to your attacking combos, that can really prove difficult and dangerous to somebody especially if it's a spice that they don't know when you're going to pull it out right and that's where i think the leg shot shines it's one of those things that you definitely want in your toolbox you want it to be available whenever you need it but you're not necessarily going to sp sprinkle every dish with it right you're not going to pull it out all the time but you are going to do it when you feel like somebody's not paying attention and then it can catch people and in that sense leg shots to the uh, above the knee fantastic and they're just as valid as fendentes um, or Sultanis or Metzanis or any, anything else. But there is something that's very different about leg shots than there is about all other things. And that is something that Fiori does mention. And he mentions this by emphasizing how serious the danger is if you go below the knee. And he says, here with the two-handed sword, you would never attack below the knee because it would place you in too much danger since it leaves you wholly uncovered. Okay. A leg shot by nature leaves you partially uncovered, okay? Because a cut to a cut to the body, you know, Mezzanis, Sotanis, Fendentes, they cross the center line and they pass through lots of posta and they can be turned into covers if you need to, right? And in the act of throwing the cut, they cross lines, right? Finishing a cut at the leg Ending a cut at the leg leaves your high and middle lines on both sides of your body completely exposed. And therefore, you only get a chance to cut the leg if you've won the measure of your opponent, right? If, if your opponent is just sitting in guard and you attack the leg, then you should expect this dummy to die. You expect to die like this guy, right? He hasn't controlled your sword. He hasn't engaged the enemy sword he has no idea where it is he's still trying to cut the leg and sure enough without even having touched swords he's dead because he tried to make a cut against the target that wholly uncovered himself so leg cuts are uh part of the reason why they're a spice right is because they need to be put into a very particular context and some place where you've won the measure you've already you've already had a uh you know one or two tempos in an engagement right you've ting tinged a bit and you've expelled their sword or you've caused motion in it or whatever and you have a tempo of free measure where you can commit your sword to their body without having to worry uh to use it to your defense uh, you can attack their leg with it right and that's a safe that's one of the only safe times really there is to commit your your, your sword to something like that where it doesn't cross lines so the leg shots by nature are more they're they're dangerous right they're risky you have to be very careful when you do them 
okay? And Fiore outlines this concept to us by outlining how much more dangerous they are if you actually attack the leg below the knee. Attacks to the thigh barely cover anything at all. Attacks below the knee don't cover anything whatsoever, right? Not whatsoever. And this also may be a reason, right, why Fiore doesn't advocate crossing the sword low um, in, in this case, right? Because then your sword is low as well um, and engaged, and then your higher middle targets are completely open. But we'll revisit that when we look at the breaking of the point. Um, so lastly, I want to say something uh, about this bit, which I find extremely fascinating. He says... All the stuff about, you know, if the guy attacks your leg, withdraw the foot, give him a fendente, don't attack too low, it's too uncovered. But if you had fallen on the ground, striking the opponent's leg would be fine. But not in any other circumstance when you're fighting with a sword against a sword. So Fury's making a comment here about a situation which, I mean, I read this as something on the battlefield, personally. right? Although I suppose you could read this as as relevant to a duel as well. Civil but, disturbance. But, uh, or a civil disturbance. Yeah, exactly. Something chaotic where you, you're you fallen to the ground. That's that's a, that's a an impossible crisis, right? For, for, for Fiore, Fiore fights on his feet. Falling to the ground is you're in super deep shit, right? And you're typically speaking, we say, if you're on the ground, your first task is to get up and arrive back on your feet, not dead, right? But Fiori makes a little comment here. If you'd fallen on the ground, maybe striking the opponent under the knee, which is the uh, imp which is the uh, uh, insinuation uh, here, striking the opponent's leg would be fine, but not in any other circumstance. So I think that's a little, really little interesting throwaway little bit, right? If you blink, you'd miss it. But there, Fiori's given us, I think, the only piece of advice that we ever get in the books about what happens if you've fallen down with a sword. Right? What's something you might do if you've fallen down with a sword? <laughs> so it's really, really interesting thing for your imagination. Okay? Um, but yeah, there's there's leg shots. There's leg shots. Really, really awesome and oft neglected. And again, I want to emphasize one of the reasons why I think most of us, or many of us, I should say more charitably, many of us neglect leg shots is just simply because of our schooling. Our schooling experience tends to neglect them. So it's something that when we start to fence, we have to intentionally put you know, brain power into adding them back in. Um, and the fact that we don't emphasize leg shots in the recruit program is likely not going to change. <laughs> it's just one of those things. Uh, it's uh, something to learn when you start defense. All right. The next play. The classic. The dope. Okay. Play. <laughs> 26 RD. The knee to the nuts. Or the kick to the nuts. Uh, but Graham, would you like to read this one for us? In a high-pitched voice, if you could. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think no, no, don't do that. For all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> For, for posterity's sake, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. kicking you in the balls mm -hmm. to give you pain and make you miss your parry. This action needs to be sudden to prevent a counter. The counter, which must be quick, is done by grabbing the student's right leg with the left hand and throwing him to the ground. All After right. Um, yeah, so <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> and uh, this sucks, but I have a video for you. Because this video will show how this play can be used both offensively and defensively. It is also the play that retired my first fencing mask. Oh, that's a that's a great image. Huh? How Murphy. you like Yeah, how you like that one? I just clicked on it. <laughs> oh, I'm about to get fucked up. All right. Yeah, at least he hit you in the chest. No, he, he cleaved my mask in twain. He put a he, he put a thumb. Yeah, but the, the kick. Oh, the kick. Is... Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. At least he did, indeed. Absolutely. I'm very thankful for that. But all right. So um so what we're gonna see um is we're gonna see Murph using this play uh defensively against someone who is charging 
uh, moderately, right? Closing the distance very, very moderately. And then I'm going to use it in the next uh, play. I'm going to use it offensively to generate more or less the same result. Okay. So I hope everybody can see uh, my screen and um, you don't really need to hear the volume, but let's, let's try it. Say only a master of evil, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> oh! 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 Hurry up and do it. What are you waiting for? There you go. Okay. Did everybody see that? Yeah. Everybody caught the video? Okay, great. All right. So there's, there's an example of this play um, being done both defensively and offensively. So let's, um, yeah, let's read the text again, blah, 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 kicking you to the balls. This action needs to be sudden to prevent a counter. The counter, which must be quick, is to grab the leg. And it's ascending to the ground. So in the video that I just showed, the first um, uh, the first context in which we saw this used was defensively. So someone was closing the measure. Um, the attacker was closing the measure, and the defender in, uh, engaged in the middle of the sword and immediately swung the measure shut, closed, and led with their with their with their uh, their foot now in both of these situations we had the courtesy to kick each other in the chest and not the balls which i'm surprised by with murph and he definitely could have uh, done that if he chose but he didn't so that's very nice of him um but you can imagine what would happen if uh if that happened <laughs> there um you could uh, drop him like a sack of potatoes all right so use defensively this is something that can prevent somebody who's crashing in from uh, uh, from outside of measure, but you can also use it aggressively. And in the second uh, example that that uh, where I did it to Murph, I gave him a couple attacks, and then uh, to to close the measure a bit, just to squeeze it a little from where we started at uh, hand body foot distance, and then I came in with the kick to disrupt, and then once I disrupted, got a strike, in. And then left under cover. Okay, so this is a, a neat little action. Um, it's not it's not just rude, actually. It's another example of a way that the feet and specifically kicks can be used aggressively and dynamically in Largo. Right. Uh, if we thought that Largo was only about the sword, we should you know n we're wrong. Right, Largo is about everything. Right, we've already seen entries with the hand. We've already seen that major motions of the feet, kicks, voids. Largo is very active. Right, any questions about this one? No. All right, cool. Sweet. Um, next one. Move on to the next one. Okay, the thrust. All right. So let's pull back a bit. So um, when in the, when we started this, I said that I preferred to, broadly speaking, look at the Largo section in two parts. Now, is this a hill that I would die on? No, it's not. But it's a convenient little slightly forced piece of order to this section, which otherwise I think is a little confusing. And the order was this, that the first half of the section every play that we've looked at up until this point, I tend to look at as talking about cuts. Okay, so we have the first master, the second master, we have these three things which are really broad principles um, involving crossing at the tips, cutting to the same side, or cutting around, and from crossings at the middle we have cuts, we have entries to the, to the, to the sword, we also have reactions to super um, uh, immoderate blows, heavy weapons, and we have a couple of, um, we have two really interesting one-off plays, a leg void and a kick to the nuts. And now we have the exchange of point. 
And I think, broadly speaking, the rest of this section is going to focus on thrusts with the last bit of the section notwithstanding. This kind of, the, these last two plays kind of buck that trend. So, as I said, it's not, it's not a hill I'd die on, it's just something broad. Okay? So, um, we've talked about cuts, we've talked a lot about cuts, and now we're going to shift a little bit. And we're going to talk about um, thrusts. So, Alex, um, you asked that question about the second master, right? Um, you know, whose students is the, which master student is the peasant, uh, peasant strike, whatever. Up until this point, you know, the, the second master, you know, he's engaged at the middle of the sword and engaged high. And the first master is engaged at the tips and also high. But all of these things we could maybe reasonably construe as being students of the masters here but now when we come to this exchange of point now it's a little harder to 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 square right and this is part of what makes this section a little bit confusing because you might think with reading this that this guy deserves a crown because everything after this is going to come from be re about thrusting it's going to be about exchange of point or breaking a point or things to do after thrusts or whatever. And it's curious that he doesn't have a crown here. So again, I'm just pointing that out for your interest. So it's chewy, right? So you can, you know, think about it. Okay. But here we are, the sixth scholar, first master, 26 VA. Let's do it. Um, who's next? Mark, would you like to read this one? This play called Exchange of Thrusts is done this way. As the opponent attacks you with the thrust, step off the line with your front foot, then pass obliquely offline, crossing his sword with your arms while thrusting in his face or chest with your point high as shown. Thank you, Mark. All right. So here we go. Exchange of thrusts. 26 VA. Um, so... So this is classically shown at Emma um, as uh, responding to a thrust in third. Okay. Um, and we talk about it this way because we want, more than anything, we want to get the principles of what's going on here ingrained in the student rather than, you know, uh, ruminate on all the different kinds of things that can happen from all the different kinds of thrusts. So for our purposes, we're just going to talk about responding to thrust in third, okay? Um, but there's lots of interesting things to talk about against different kinds of thrust. Thrust in fourth, thrust in second, against thrust in prime, what do you do? Blah, 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 right? But let's talk about the exchange of thrust. What is it, okay? So um, one view is this, that the exchange of thrust here begins our discussion of thrusting in the same way that our first rem our first master here began our discussion of cuts in the way that emma chooses to interpret it which is uh, this first master is involves a single time remedy okay emma also chooses broadly speaking to interpret the uh this exchange of point here as some as effectively a single time remedy Okay, though notably there are two pieces of footwork in here, right? And also notably that there is some debate about precisely what body mechanics need to be in, uh, in place here between the chapters. Last time I recall talking to Emma Guelph about it, as it happens, I recall there being some interesting uh, differences and discussions about it. So all that is to say is that the actual mechanics of how this is done have some uh, small uh, variants within the Emma chapters. But broadly speaking, we're all um, united on the main points. And the main points are this. Against a thrust, one way to defend the thrust and threaten to kill them your own, uh, yourself, much like in the first Remedy Master, is to do what Fiore says, uh, exchange the point. And by exchange a point, we typically mean to do an action which changes whose point is on the center line. Okay, so I'm probably going to need the snip for this. 
Come on, Snippy. Get over here. All righty. So the center line is, of course, uh, the line that bisects our, our bodies, right? Um, there's a straight line that bisects our bodies, and the center line is that bisection uh, sticking out into uh, the engagement between us, into the space between between us, right? So this is the center line, and where wherever our our chest faces is where our center line is. Okay, so um, the, when we're doing say a volta stabile, for example, our center line absolutely changes, right? Footwork changes our center line in, in a dramatic way. And uh, control the center line and, and where this you're facing is really important. But so what this play is conventionally is this. This uh, attacker was intending to thrust in post the longa straight down their center line, right, into the opponent's chest. And instead, what this opponent has done, starting with this foot forward, but it, this foot was back, was back here a little bit. What they've done is they've come from whatever post that they were lying in. They increased forward with their foot a little off to the side and they expressed their posta as fully as they could, engaging that thrust as early as they could, just like we would be if we were sort of crossing at the tips, right? They engage the thrust super early. And then once they touch the thrust, once they engage the thrust, the act of engaging the thrust changed the point. It deviated the point from its previous direction. Because the thrust can be set aside with the strength of a child. Okay, that's a very, that, that's, a, that's a bedtime phrase. Never forget it. George Silver. George Silver. Avadi also says something like that as well. I was reading him a bit today. Um, the thrust, a thrust can be set aside with the strength, with the strength of a child. Okay. So all it requires to deviate this thrust from the, ooh, that's a terrible drawing. All it requires to deviate this thrust from the center line is effectively contact, right? Contact with some structure behind it. So what's happened is the scholars deviated the point and put his own point online instead. He's exchanged the point as it were. And once he swapped his point out, and his point was the one on the center line, he drove that bastard home with a nice passing step and put it six inches through the back of this guy's chest. Right? And this picture, circumstantially, he's putting it up to his face. You know, if he, and you can see how his arms are a little low, right? If he, if he raises his arms in the cross a bit, he could put that easily six to eight inches through his chest, through the back of his throat. Right. Super, super quick. And though it, it, it involves two pieces of footwork, when done well, this is effectively a single time action. OK, or equivalent, which is why it's uh, we, we would like to draw uh, parallels with the first play of, uh, of Longsword. OK, so this is what um, this is the exchange of point. Does anybody have any questions about any concepts that I talked about? No? Okay. So, um, who cares? Why bother, right? If a thrust can be set aside with the strength of a child, then why not a simple pair of repost against, against thrusts, right? If you can just kind of tap them away and move on your own, then, then what's the big deal? And the big deal is this, that in the same way that the single-time remedy against the Fendenta is important to introduce, the, to force the fencing logic into the engagement here, so too is the exchange of point. Where if we try to exchange the point and they respond and attempt to prevent it, we gain huge advantage. Not only could we succeed in the exchange of point and kill them uh, uh, with a single time remedy, but if they prevent the single time remedy, it's likely that they'll prevent it in a way that gives you an advantage, right? Um, if you spring this on somebody and 
um, uh, Maestro Martinez, uh, when he has come in to do some sessions on Spanish rapture for us, um, he likes to talk about, um, when, when he talks about tempo for the defender, he likes to talk about um, uh, bullfighting. And it's true that based on the defense necessary that a, a defender has to do against any given blow, a defender doesn't necessarily have to act immediately as soon as they know the, the strike that's coming. And there are, there are some fighters actually, like um, circumstantially like Kel, who's with us tonight, there are some fighters who are very um, good at holding their action until the, the right moment, until they, you know, reserving their action until they really need to, to give it. And this makes it very difficult to provoke them. Right, because you know you're not going to suss out their actions and get an engagement with enough time for you to continue to to think and strategize as an attacker. Right, the people people like that force you to give a committed attack because they're not coming out if you don't give a committed attack. But as soon as you give a committed attack, they have a prepared end, uh, a prepared response that sets you behind in tempo, and then you got to get out. So it's a real pain in the ass. Right, very difficult to fence against and against thrusts. Because thrust can be set aside with the strength of a child, exchange of point is sometimes advantageous to delay just a teeny tiny bit to spring upon the enemy in the last moment so that it's almost impossible for them to counter. And if they counter it, they're going to have to counter it by over parrying or overreacting so much that it can give you extreme advantages. So this shows you, this fact shows you a little bit of why cuts and thrusts are kind of different. Thrusts entail a slightly larger commitment than cuts. Cuts are a little more cagey. Thrusts are a little a, a little less so. So when you're giving committed thrusts, you're very prone to exchanges of point. Very prone. They they rob your tempo immediately, right? Just in the way that the, the first play of longsword, just in, just in the way that those single time remedies do, right? And um, yeah, and they're 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 problematic. Um, yeah, and so and so again, once you've introduced that that logic, then the engagement falls out, and you can make decisions based on um, the tempo that you've that you've gained, and um, as a defender, you're starting to lead and uh, and do well. So j just like it uh, it would be if you you were dealing with uh, cuts, dealing with cuts. Okay, and so um, following that. Uh, uh, following this, we're going to look at the rest of these of these plays here. Okay. So um, exchange a point, dealing with the same concepts really that we dealt with with the first master, but applying them to thrusts. Okay. Next guy, twenty six VB. We have an entry to the hand, the handle. How interesting. Another entry. Um, Bruce, would you like to read the text for us? Uh, <clears throat> okay. This play derives from the exchange of thrusts that we just saw. Let's say the student in the play before me didn't immediately thrust to the opponent's face, hesitating instead with his point, directing it to the opponent's face or chest because the latter was in armor. Without, without directing it. Uh, <clears throat> to his point, mm -hmm. without directing it to his mm -hmm. to the opponent's face or chest, because the latter was in armor. In this case, the student should pass forward with his left foot and perform this grapple. Next, he should use his sword to strike, since the opponent's weapon has been grabbed and cannot be freed. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. All right. So here's another example of a play where Fury specifically mentions armor but the figures are not drawn so, right? But again, as if we needed more evidence, uh, Fiori seems to be thinking with armor, uh, he seems to be thinking unarmored armored with both sides of his brain, right? He's got one side of his brain for each this whole time. Uh, you know, he's not just talking about unarmored combat here. Or at least he's not, he, he, he hasn't put armored combat out of his mind throughout this whole book. So he says, if the student, if the scholar had um, 
not immediately thrust to the opponent's face, but he hesitated with this point without directing it to the opponent's face or chest because the latter was in armor. So he made the crossing, but he didn't pass forward to drive the crossing home. Okay, so let's recall, in this case, the student made the crossing with the right foot, and then he passed forward and drove the crossing home. Okay, but in the case where the the uh, the face was armored, if you are saying, well, you can do this instead. You've made the crossing, you've put his sword point offline, so necessarily you should be able to see his hilt, his handle. And one thing you can do is pass forward and grab that handle. And now you have a significant grapple on his on the handle of his sword. And you can use your sword, as he says, to strike. Um, you can use your sword in a variety of ways. You could disarm his sword. You could do a bunch of stuff. But here's a here's a, an entry, another entry onto the sword that can come from a situation uh, from an exchange of point. Right? Um, it's also possible, of course, that maybe you decide to do this but uh, because you fucked up. The guy isn't... Um, so you hesitated, not because he was unarmored, but because you just hesitated. <laughs> you might also try to do this as well. All right? Um, though, keep in mind that this logic requires you to be leader. If you hesitate so much that the tempo evens out, which really only is only very uh, is only a moment, but if you hesitate enough, the tempo evens out, and you go to enter, they can enter too. Right? They could stop your entry. They could reverse. They could do a whole bunch of things. So, the time window we're talking about here is very tense, very small. But here's an entry to the to the hand. Okay. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, all right. Next play. And the suspense is killing us. Mm -hmm. Didn't load the image. What's going on here? Here we go. Eighth scholar. Oh, maybe my internet's being a little slow. Hmm. Well, let's um, let's while waiting for that to, that page to load. So here's the <laughs> here's the eighth scholar here. We and we call this the breaking of point. Twenty six VC is the folio. Twenty six VC. Uh, and can we have Renat? Oh, the page loaded. Yay! Look at that. Cool. Breaking of point. Uh, Renat, would you like to read this one? All right. Thank you. This is another way to defend against the trust. As I have said in the exchange of trust, the second play before me, we need to perform an acrestimento and a pass off the line. Do the same in this play, except that in the exchange of trust, the arms are low and the point high. As I said before, in this play, which is called breaking the, the trust, the student has his arms high makes a fedente while performing in a crescimento and a pass of the line. He throws the opponent's thrust sideways, almost at mid-blade, to beat it to the ground. Then he immediately goes to the close play. Thank you, Renat. Excellent. Okay, so let's read this one. We want to read other ones. Um, okay. These, these two, these next two, are all from Breaking a Point. Actually, this one is as well, in my opinion, but let's let's take those as we as they come. So, okay, cool. So, Breaking a Point. So, there's two main concepts that Fiori talks about against thrusts. He talks about exchanging the point, and he talks about breaking the point. So, um, so you can also break the point, okay? While it's true that the single time remedies are um, are great, right? Obviously, it's kind of a, it's kind of tautological. Um, breaking thrusts, uh, uh, can, breaking the point, you can also do. And depending on what post that you're in or what circumstance, it may be something that you might choose to do explicitly, right? In uh, at Emma, my impression 
is that in the recruit curriculum, the breaking of thrust is often shown as something you might try and do if your exchange of point fails, which is definitely a valid place for it. But in the text, Fiore also says that you could choose to do it. And specifically, he says, the student has his arms high, you know, I read Finestra, La Donna, something like that. He makes a fendente against the thrust while performing an accrescimento in a pass off line. And in so doing, he throws the opponent's thrust sideways, almost at mid blade, to beat it to the ground. And then he immediately goes to close play. So by the text description, it seems like Fiore is talking about engaging thrusts from above and beating them to the ground, okay? Though one could be forgiven for reading this as suggesting that he's kind of beating the thrust away, kind of sending it sideways, sending it off sideways um, almost at mid-blade. Um, but that's not the... Um, that's not the common view at Emma in, in my uh, under understanding. The common interpretation of the breaking of thrust at Emma, in my understanding, is that the thrust is broken with, uh, with the specific attempt to pin it to the ground. Not only to, th to get the point stuck in the ground, Right. And in, in various terrains, this is more or less feasible. Right. If you're on hard gravel, you're probably not going to do it. But if you're on earth, um, that point could get stuck uh, for uh, quite significantly. Right. If you if you throw it to the ground there. But if you're engaged in a, at a true cross at mid blade and suppress a sword to the ground from above, you can stick it into the ground even against uh, in terrain which where swords don't sink into the earth like say wood floors of a cell okay and effectively pinning the sword down and this can open opportunities depending on how the engagement ended up it can open opportunities for things like stepping on the sword or or other things okay so um it's definitely in my view that the the spirit of this play is not to just beat thrusts down with fendentes and throw the thrusts away. It's to hammer the thrust into the ground and pin it. That, and that's the that's the the intent with the breaking of the thrust. If uh, obviously if if possible, right? If you can if you can uh, if you can manage it. Um, Fiore says. Blah, 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 passing offline, do that thing, and then immediately go to the close play. Okay? This is Fury's suggestion. Um, in this perfectly makes sense. You do have opportunities to enter if you pull this off. But also for your consideration, I submit to you that depending on the distance between you, it's also possible to continue Largo after this. All depends on the on the context, on the circumstance. If you get a nice, um, uh, what we're going to look at in a second is stepping on the sword. If there's a, de a decent space between you, you get a nice break into the ground, you pin it, you step on the sword, sword falls from his hand, and you still have space between you, you can cut him to your heart's content, and you can cut him while moving moving away, increasing your distance. Right. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to go to the close play every time you break the point. But if you wanted to go to the close play, breaking the point would be a great way to start to set that up. Right. Getting to Stretto, if you want to get there, getting to Stretto needs doing. Right. You don't just pass from Largo into Stretto without effort, especially against somebody who really knows what they're doing. Someone who really knows their Largo will make it difficult uh, as best they can to, uh, and dangerous to get into Stretto. So you can't just run in there. Um, and this is maybe one way where you can inflict Stretto on, on your enemy. All right? Um, yeah. So, a breaking a point. Um, great for getting in Stretto. Can possibly keep you in Largo. 
you want to do this as best you can at a true cross. There's not much more to say about it because we'd have to do it. We have to demonstrate it, at least from my from my view. Okay, any questions about this one? No. Um, lastly, I will oh, I'll also s say this one thing. Um, there's a there's an interesting scholarly debate at Emma about um, breaking and exchanging the point that involves when you should do or uh, that involves the sidedness of posta. And I'm not going to uh, get into the debate, but I'm telling this to you again to to um, uh, inspire your memory, maybe scandalize you. There is a opinion at Emma held by many that Fiore seems to say from posters on the right side you may exchange or break but from posters on the left side you ought to break and not exchange and that's a really interesting thing if you if you stop and think about it okay so I, I offer that to you to think about. Because we kind of started a little late, I am going to go later. It's 9.51. Um, so uh, those of you who, um, uh, those of you who uh, uh, need to leave, need to leave, leave, it, it'll be recorded, right? This is being, this is being recorded. So go ahead and leave, and you can catch it up when uh, when you when you look at the recording. Okay, so um, here we go. Uh, breaking a point. Now we're on to these two. Folio twenty six VD. Twenty six VD. Here we go. I just double checked that we were recording. We are. I had a heart attack. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Who's next on the list? Um, I just lost my Zoom list here. Mm -hmm. um, where's Zoom? All right, who'd like to read this one? I'll do it. All right, Beanie, go ahead. The student before me has beaten the opponent's sword to the ground, and I am completing his play. After beating his sword to the ground, I forcefully place my right foot on his sword, which will either break it or prevent it from doing me any harm. But it's not enough. As soon as I have done that, I strike him under the beard or in the neck with my false edge, and immediately come back with a fendente to his hands or arms as shown. Thank you, Beatty. So this is Fury's anti-hipster play, right? He, uh, he saw the TikTok of people putting Christmas trees in their beards, and he decided to add this uh, play to his manuscript. We um, should done one for the man bun. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I, I feel like Swan Hat would have hated the man bun. That's just my that's that's my view on it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, so this is again breaking of point, showing how once you've broken the point against a still blade, you can um, step on it, potentially breaking the sword or at least um, tearing it out of your opponent's grasp. It also allows you to pin the sword to the ground and free your sword from needing to be engaged with it. So you can cut up and and strike him. And you know, once your sword is moving here, you're you're gonna want to keep moving, right? The way for this guy to stop this is either to leave and run or to press to strato. And so uh, if he leaves and runs, then you're great. You you then you're safe, I guess, until he tells his buddies. If he presses to strato, then you might be in deep trouble. Right, and he, if he has the dagger, who knows? He could turn the tide. So once that sword is is leaving and cutting, you better keep cutting, right, until he's no longer able to offend you. But here we see uh, the opportunities that breaking a point can give you, and opportunities that are clearly in the vein of Largo, right? These are these are Largo actions. Um, and note, stre he stresses that this is not enough. Right after beating the sword to the ground, I can put my right foot on the sword, which can break it, but it's not enough. Right? Not enough. Any questions about this one? Uh, oh, I should also say that um, uh, in the breaking of point between Emma Sal's, there's also some interesting variants as to how they um, how they articulate the footwork. 
which footsteps on the sword where and why. Um, so watch out for that when we return to the cells or when you're uh, when we finally start practicing again. There are some interesting little differences to, as to what foot goes where or when to even attempt the uh, uh, the uh, uh, this thing. In in my view, I tend to not advocate people attempt this unless the sword is just like the hand grab in the presence of the feet. If the sword is not in the presence of the feet, I uh, I it, it's not my thing. I don't tend to advocate for it. Uh, it's not my not my style, and I certainly don't like advocating for it with a passing step. I think a passing step to get the um, to get the the step on the sword is too long. But that's just my my general view. Do you have any Do you have any specific uh, feelings or thoughts about this, Kel? Out of out of curiosity. Um, I tend to agree with you there. Yep. It's you can do it um, on the left side, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can put your left foot down, but that affects your cut to the throat. Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's kind of challenging geometrically. Um, mm -hmm. it, 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 typically speaking, if you're if you're beating down a sword, you're going to bring your right foot forward anyway. So it's kind of a half step forward. Mm -hmm. It's not a passing step. Yeah. Um, in that the act of beating down a sword is is not something you can accomplish with uh, the volta stabil. Yeah, agree, agree. Yeah, you need a good step to do it for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, cool, cool. But that, um, again, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The question, like, I, I don't recall other times when uh, Fiore was like, do two attacks, because here he's like, slice him up the beard and then down the beard. Um, is there like a particular reason for that, or is it just flavor? Well, circumstantially, actually, we've seen him uh, talk about cutting combos a number of times um, in both of the Boar's Tooth plays. Um, that we read, um, both the middle boar's tooth and the uh, regular boar's tooth. He talks about um, a bunch of cuts, a bunch of cutting combos. Um, let's look at them at the boar's tooth. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm targeting this one specifically because it's beginning with a false edge cut, right? And in this play here, it looks like this cut's going to begin false edge. And from something of a boar's tooth position circumstantially but so just to read the text again alex um this is uh boar's tooth since it has learned its defenses from the boar it can deliver strong underhand thrusts all the way to the opponent's face without stepping it then comes back down with a fidenti to the arms after thrusting some sometimes it can deliver a thrust to the opponent's face point up while performing a quick accrescimento with the front foot and recover back in guard with a fidenti to the heads and arm uh, the head and arms then it can immediately deliver another thrust and I think Middle Boar's Tooth talks about sultanis or cuts, doesn't it? Say something about that. Um, blah, blah, blah. Just like the boar, it strikes at an angle. From this guard, the sword always strikes at an angle to the opponents. From this guard, always attack with thrusts. Okay, fine. Uncover your opponent, mess up his hands, and some, uh, his hands and sometimes his head and arms. So um, we have precedent for a series of cuts from this poster, uh, from this broad place before, uh, Alex. Um, so... You know, why does he mention a couple cuts? Well, it could be because, of course, we're kind of in that zone. But it could also be for the reason that I mentioned, that this is Largo. And because of the martial circumstance here, in this sort of scenario he's laid out, one cut isn't going to be sufficient. Right? You're not going to roll your life on one cut. Right? Maybe, maybe you cut halfway through his arm. Great. His right arm. Maybe he draws a dagger with his left arm and rushes you. And you're, you're sitting there admiring your work. You know, right? Um, just like one dagger thrust isn't going to cut it, uh, one cut is not. <laughs> uh, I just, I'm, I'm about to make a pun. One cut isn't going to cut it. <laughs> ah, fuck. All right. Does that answer your question? Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. So there we go. Um, that is this breaking a point 26 VD with a step. Now let's look at this one. 26 or 27 RA, more or less this, uh, the same, but I'll, I'll read this one. This play also pertains to the breaking of the thrust, the second play before me. After beating the opponent's sword to the ground, I immediately press my right foot over his blade, and as I do so, I strike him in the head as show. Um, a, a note to self, BD, um, this might be another interesting poster to talk about when we're talking about cutting from all guards. 
Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so this is another example of what one can do from the breaking of the thrust, or the breaking of point. He's done the suppression, um, and then he's done a fendente instead of doing a sotani. Okay, but again, more of the same, more or less more of the same. Okay. So any questions about the breaking of the, of the, the thrust there, the breaking of point? No? Okay, cool. So yeah, again, thrusts. The two big topics, exchange of point, breaking of point. Um, it does work in a way that if you attempt an exchange of point as often as you can, failure to exchange often results in an opportunity to break. Uh, if you just attempt to break the point, you don't get an, an opportunity to exchange the point. So, um, you know, if one is seeking single time remedies, one is, you know, it's better to try to exchange and then break if you have to, than just go for breaking. However, that's not to say that breaking is bad. It's just something that it is what it is, right? It's good where it works and it's bad where it doesn't. Okay. And, you know, especially if you're, if you, your thrust, if you, you're given a committed thrust and a high guard, then breaking a point is going to be something that uh, you're going to consider. Though, of course, you could also exchange the point from high guards. There's nothing preventing you from being in Ladano or Finestra against the thrust in third from transitioning, if you have the time, to something like uh, a breve or whatever and, uh, and, and, and doing this. Okay. Um, moving on to this one. This is a fun one. This is a party pleaser. Uh, impresses all the ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Folio 27RB. Um, uh, Alex, would you like to read this one? This is another play pertaining to the breaking of the thrust. If after I break the thrust, the opponent lifts his sword to parry, I immediately put my hilt within his right arm near his right hand and quickly grasp my blade near the point with my left hand, wounding him in the head. If I want, I can also place my sword to his neck and slit his windpipe. Awesome. I love how Leone changed throat to windpipe. Like, what? <laughs> what? Uh, is that more accurate? All right, all right. Okay, cool. So this play here. Um, all right. Now, it's too bad I didn't prepare any video because this is very difficult to describe. But I'm going to try. So I'm going to need a different snip. I'm going to need this snip. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. So how how does this play work? Okay. Short answer is I have no idea. But I <laughs> I've seen I've seen people give an interpretation of this play that makes sense to me. And having seen, I think I saw this, uh, some European club did this interpretation on video, uh, I don't know, five or six years ago, and I saw it and I thought, yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm convinced. It, it's probably something like that. Okay? It's probably something like that. And so that, uh, that view is this. So the end result is here. The end result is here. And the beginning is here. Okay? So, uh, and where's my snip? So we've broken the point and we're on the opponent's left side. Okay. So we're, cro we're crossing the sword. We're on the opponent's left side. Right now, the opponent is in mortal danger because there's no, there's nothing preventing my sword from coming straight up and cutting him in the beard. Right. It doesn't matter that I don't have my foot on it. There's nothing preventing me from just shoo, rising right up. And as a matter of fact, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rise up and I'm going to attempt to cut my opponent in the beard. But my opponent, being a hipster, not wanting me to, da to damage the really expensive Christmas tree ornaments that he has in his beard, follows me. So as my sword rises, his sword rises. And his sword rises in contact with my sword because, of course, it, he, he needs to. He needs to know where my sword is because he needs to guide his my sword away from his beard. So as I lift, he lifts. Okay, as I lift, he lifts. And that ends up, what this ends up with 
is us crossed up here, right? Or, no, nah, that's actually too high. That's way too high. Um, we're more crossed like here, right? So his sword is going to come up. My sword is going to come up. Let me get rid of these arrows. Yeah. And so we end up crossing right here. Okay, right near his face. And as my sword rises, and I feel him rising with me, I abandon my plan to cut him in his face, and I pass forward with my rise. So as our swords lift, I pass forward, and I push the true edge of my sword this way. And what happens is the true edge of my sword is going to come around from the, my, because our sword started on the right here, right? Or on the opponent's left. My true edge is going to come around and I'm pushing my hands towards this side. And what I'm going to find is I'm going to find a little hole right here that has, that has occurred um, uh, by, by necessity because this person's sword has uh, come from below to high, right? It's risen. And so there's a little hole here between his hands and his hips and his sword. And, I, and I've pushed my sword across to this side. As soon as my sword crosses his, my pommel is going to be above this little hole. I sink the pommel in there. Okay, and we can see in this in this image. Let me make the image a little uh, bigger. We can see in this image the pommel is sunk under this wrist. Okay, so as this sword came over, as soon as the hole appeared, the pommel was sunk into the wrist, and that basically trapped this geometrical structure. This sword is. The sword is, is is pretty much trapped. And once that pommel was in I and I passed around, I could then commit my sword to his neck. And my sword was, is completely on the other side. And it doesn't matter that my sword is now no longer in direct contact with his blade, that our blades aren't connected, because his sword is now fixed in, in place. And in fact, this whole structure from his hand to his um, shoulder to his neck is one solid geometrical block. And once you're here, you can transition with a with a volta stabile. You can transition to like true cross or full, um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, um, a tutta porta de ferro, whatever. And you can throw this guy by his neck with the blade of your sword on his neck to the ground very easily. Okay, so I realized that was a long description. I did my best. Uh, this is something that, you know, usually we pull it at the end of class. It's, we don't often even show recruits this because practicing this, it's it's quite involved, this little play. Um, but, uh, but that's what it is, right? It's a neat, really neat follow-on to the natural threat that the breaking of point uh, provides. The natural threat is to come up with a sultani to the beard and you know fa and and the great thing about this play and this is something that personally really suits my style of fencing i like things when you win when your opponent didn't really make a mistake right and in this case the threat was so imminent that him following you wasn't really a mistake right he he, he should have done it better but what he did wasn't super wrong, right? It wasn't out of left field. He was just trying to keep up and not die. But you 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 calculated that, right? You had him dead to rights. So I think this is a really neat uh, a really neat play. Very cool. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, interrupt you there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think you missed a pretty critical step in mm -hmm. the in the middle. Mm -hmm. The Zugadore, who is threatened mm -hmm. being cut under the throat. Mm -hmm. uh, being overbound on his right, which is the worst possible position a sort of can find him or herself in. Yep. Um, they flinch. They go back. Yes. You pull the sword up. 
you don't just flick the sword up because you're flicking the sword straight at your face. Yes. So you're going to flinch, and that's going to be a pass back with the left foot. Ah, okay. Right. Okay. Sure. So that takes his face out of range of his sword as he sweeps it up and tries to cast sure. it off to his mm -hmm. left, your right. Mm -hmm. um, by missing that particular comment, I think you would confuse a lot of people because the measure is impossible. And if you look right. at the foot placement in the next play, mm -hmm. you'll see that he has turned and presented his right shoulder, the Zugadori has mm -hmm. turned and presented his right shoulder, the right side of his body, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. allows you to pass to the opposite side right. from, from um, effectively uh, flying a gate sideways to him. Mm -hmm. uh, you're sweeping across and because your blade's going to miss his face, mm. you can now hook your pommel in as you described all mm. the rest of it. Mm. But without that step of him flinching as he rises his sword, he's still mm. going to get hit in the face. Cool. And it's, as you yeah. well know, when mm. you know you're going to get hit in the face, you try to get out of there. Absolutely. You've done it many times to me. Yeah. And I've done it many times to you. Absolutely. So, this is something I think that you missed, mm. and it really belongs. I know it's a very long description, and it's just as well that we don't teach this to recruits. Yeah. But the recruits should look at this and go, ooh, I'd like to work on that someday, because <laughs> it is a very interesting play. Mm -hmm. It involves uh, both uh, half-sorting and pommel controls. Mm -hmm. Which well, are, you know, really important things to do. You got to be able to use all the parts of the sword. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Kel. Thank you very much for that for that addition. So, nothing else for me to say on that. Please take note. Right. That's uh, absolutely part of it. Okay. Um, for everyone that you know that has still no idea, can even envision how this play is going to uh, going to go. Suffice it to know that there is a working. <laughs> interpretation of this play uh, for practice on the floor, right? That that may seem rather benign, rather obvious, but uh, you know, when when Emma started, most of these plays didn't have working interpretations on the floor, right? Uh, and you know, and one of the things I hope people appreciate um, in taking time to go through the manuscript is to appreciate again how much distance there is between the manuscript and what we teach on the south floor, what we practice on the south floor. There's an absolute impossible amount of work. You know, we stand on the shoulders of giants and on the many, many, many recruits and scholars that all came before us and collectively helped us refine and understand our, our inter interpretations. Uh, you know, when something like this doesn't just happen out of the blue, it doesn't just take a smart person to figure it out, it takes uh, you know, uh, 20 years of a community to, um, to figure out these things. So, um, let's try to finish Largo. No, we should probably quit there. Oh, you think so? You think that's it? Okay. Yeah. So uh, we, we did do quite, quite a significant amount today. Um, so what's left with Largo? Let's just, uh, let's just see that. All right. So we have an elbow push and we have the false point play. Then we have a bit of a conclusion and then we should probably sort of summarize and reflect so maybe this is a good place to stop it is 10 13 it's quite late um i do apologize again for the technical difficulties i don't know why discord was being stupid today i hope uh, our switch to zoom sufficed um kel and bd is bd still here yep uh, and and is andrew still here no i suggest okay. that Which, you make yeah, a note uh, mm -hmm. Okay, I suggest that you make a note to start at the uh, <clears throat> uh, breaking a point next week. Review this part because we lost a lot of people in the last 15 minutes. I'm sure. I'm sure we did. Okay, so I, I will definitely do that. It's probably, it's worth a, a reviewing anyway. Uh, Kel, Beatty, and Andrew, are there anything that you'd like to add or subtract from tonight? From what I've said. No, no, it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. I have my own version of that last play that I do on the floor. I'd like to show it to you the next oh, cool. time we can get together. But <laughs> I'd love it. Yeah, yeah, I'd love it. Like I said, me personally, I've never had any clue about how the fuck this happens. I've just seen others do it cool in cool ways. So that's uh, that's me. I've I've never made it work in real time. I've only been able no. to demonstrate. Same, same. Me yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cool one though. 
Uh, remember uh, the last mm -hmm. time, the but I, I do remember the last time we were doing this in class. Like, mm -hmm. I was demonstrating it. I was de demonstrating it with you, mm -hmm. uh, like as the Zugador. Mm -hmm. I ra uh, like a, I raised my hands like we always do in Guelph to give mm -hmm. you the opening, and then you grab my hands and move them someplace else, and then finish the play. So oh. I think <laughs> we're doing something differently. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> maybe we are. <laughs> no, you have to attack me properly. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's very good. Yeah, I, I, I watched the Jim Carrey, uh, the Jim Carrey sketch. Mm -hmm. Um, now watch me shift my liver to the side to avoid your knife. All right, uh, Abidi, did you have anything to add or subtract? No. Okay. Uh, great. So w with that, then, um, if nobody has any last questions, then um, we will resume next week with a uh, breaking of point. And uh, we'll hopefully Discord will cooperate. And uh, other than that, scholars look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. And um, everybody else, we'll see you next uh, next Monday. And it was a pleasure. Cool. Have a good night. Good night. Uh, here, yeah. hang, hang yes, in sir. For a bit. Yeah, please. Um, how's Carol doing? She must be very um, close now, eh? Uh, let me uh, f stop recording, and then uh, I'll answer your question. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks, everybody. Just